What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into this thing. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today, by far the most requested story of the day today, are the massive YouTube changes affecting tons of small creators on this site. There's been so much outrage, people have been getting stripped of their ability to monetize their videos, so, so let's talk about what's happening. So in the before times, in the long, long ago, YouTube was at a point where they were like, hey, we have all these ads, you wanna put ads on your video, you wanna make money, let's do business. And it really wasn't hard to join the partner program, get ads ads on your video. Then in April of 2017, YouTube said, okay, we have requirements. You have to have 10,000 lifetime views on this channel. You get those 10,000 views and you qualify to join the monetization program. But as of last night, YouTube changed the requirements. To just be eligible for the partner program, you have to have 1,000 subscribers on your channel and 4,000 hours of watch time over the past 12 months. Also a note here, there's been some confusion around what is watch time. There have been people saying, I have to upload 4,000 hours of, no, that's not. I used yesterday's video as an example. That video was 12 minutes, 32 seconds. If someone watched is the entire thing that's 12 minutes 32 seconds towards the total so if i did some rough not exact math i would need 19,200 people to watch that video in full to qualify that said something to consider not every youtuber's videos are as long as mine also you shouldn't expect your entire audience to have a 100 percent watch through rate if you make short form animated content it's a minute you're gonna need a lot more views to qualify but you don't have to get all the views on one video it's a, it's the entire archive for the past 12 months so depending on the kind of creator you are the requirement as far as hours is going to affect you differently now as far as youtube's reasoning for these changes, they wrote in the blog post, we've arrived at these new thresholds after thorough analysis and conversations with creators like you. They will allow us to significantly improve our ability to identify creators who contribute positively to the community and help drive more ad revenue to them and away from bad actors. These higher standards will also help us prevent potentially inappropriate videos from monetizing, which can hurt revenue for everyone. Now that specific line made it so a lot of people thought that this was Logan Paul's fault. If you're even remotely paying attention to YouTube, you know that there's been mass controversy and outrage against Logan Paul these past two weeks, both because he was very disrespectful to Japan and the people in in Japan, as well as also showing a dead body in a video, in a thumbnail, and giving a douchey apology before giving a seemingly sincere apology. This specific move isn't because of Logan Paul. This specific move and change is due to three factors. The first, due to the Adpocalypse 1.0, extremist content propaganda videos being monetized, the media beat up YouTube over this, advertisers pulled their money, you most likely remember. The second part was Adpocalypse 3.0, or as I refer to it as the Kidpocalypse. All those disgusting and weird channels that were geared towards children, showing them incredibly inappropriate stuff that we're getting ad money. And finally, three copycat channels. There are channels dedicated to stealing and mimicking the content of larger YouTubers, and they just they just get to make that ad money. And so to me, it appears that YouTube had two shitty choices to make. One, keep things as they were and continue to get hammered both by the community and the media. Or two, raise the minimum requirements to join the YouTube partner program so that they have enough eyes to make sure that the content that they are going to put ads on is not stolen content, is not extremist content, is not inappropriate towards children, but shown to be some sort of cartoon content. And I'll say to you what I said to them when they asked me what I thought about these changes about a week ago. I personally get it, but there is going to be a ton of backlash, especially because there's one main thing, and this is where there's the most outrage and controversy. No channel was grandfathered in. So channels that met the previous requirement that no longer hit this new requirement, they're kicked out of the partner program. And that has been seen by a lot of people in the community as an overcorrection. They're not just changing the size of the doorway into the program, they're kicking people out. So understandably, people are freaking out when they're getting an email from YouTube over for the past 24 hours saying you're no longer eligible and if you don't hit these requirements, you're gonna lose access February 20th. Now YouTube defends this in the blog post saying people have until February 20th, 2018. It's a 30 day grace period. And while these changes will affect a significant number of channels, 99% of those affected were making less than $100 per year in the last year with 90% earning less than $2.50 in the last month. And so to this, I say, I understand where YouTube is coming from. But the thing I think YouTube's not considering is one, via AdSense, you can't get paid out unless you have $100. So the question becomes how many of that 90 percent were getting close to $100, ready to get their first paycheck, and now they're getting kicked back. Because this is such a massive change, I would personally ask YouTube to figure out how they could pay out the AdSense that had not been paid yet, even if they didn't hit that $100 threshold since they have now changed the footing for that YouTuber. Now, as far as changes that were affected by Logan Paul, we could look to the Google Preferred changes. That, of course, Google's program for just super top-tier advertising. YouTube announcing an increased vetting process for these videos, saying every video submitted for Google Preferred ads must be watched by a human moderator and manually approved as family-friendly content. Right, so that change is the Logan Paul change. They're like, okay, we gotta put a human body on this to make sure Logan Paul's not showing another dead body. Now, because I don't want all these small creators just to feel left completely abandoned right now, I'm, I'm gonna give out free advice. Whether you're a large creator or more importantly, you are a small creator, you need to look at other sources of revenue. It's something that I've preached for years and years and years. We can't always count on drunk stepdaddy YouTube to be looking out for us. For the long term, you need to figure out ways to make money on YouTube, not necessarily from YouTube. Let's say you're not eligible for the YouTube Partner Program 
them under these new rules. You have under a thousand subscribers, maybe your videos are getting 500, 800 views. On that video where you're getting less than a thousand views, YouTube is giving you most likely a dollar or less. If you set up a Patreon and only 1% of your audience signs up, if you're getting 800 views, that's still eight people and all of a sudden you're making more on Patreon than on YouTube. Also go to Teespring and just, just put the name of your channel on a shirt. Same concept, if you can get 1% of your audience to convert, on that audience that if you put out four videos in a month that you would have made less than most likely $4, if you can get just 1%, eight people to buy a shirt, you price it out properly, that's around $80 that month. I've been where you are, every dollar matters at that point. I mean, when I started making videos after it got past the hobby point, there's, there wasn't even a partner program at that time. That's not me trying to take away from people being hit today, but it's why I've always been of this mindset. And there are also so many other ways just coming out that you can make new money and people can support other creators. One of the things I'm most excited about, especially since the crypto market's getting slammed over the past 36 hours, Brave and the basic attention token. Brave is their fantastic browser, it's blocking ads, it's blocking annoying malware scripts, all the shitty stuff, but built into that badass browser based on what you actually watch on YouTube or blogs you read, you can support creators. You just go into the settings and you say, I wanna give this amount to the creators that I watch. The way I oversimplify it to my friends is it's essentially like YouTube Red, but you can choose if you want your money to go to someone or not. Because you can do these monthly payouts based on what you actually watch, or if there's someone listed you don't like, hit that trash can. If there's someone you wanna pay no matter how much you actually watch, you hit that pin and then you enter in the percentage you want them to get every month. And that's it, and what's also awesome, Today they announced that if you go to brave.com slash million, you get Brave for desktop, you receive a new basic attention token grant. It's about $5, no cost to you. And boom, you can start supporting the creators and sites that you like. And you can look at this as one of two things. I'm personally of the mindset of the, the long term, this is the future. Or if you're a creator, small or large, you can tell your audience about it, have them sign up, they get like the $5 a bag, have them hit the pin, type in 100% on your channel. Boom, just one person from your audience does that. You're getting more value than that hypothetical channel we were talking about earlier with 800 subs would get from an entire month. Also, I advise creators big and small to sign up, get their verified accounts on Brave. That's a second link I'll include in the description. Also, the people signing up, getting that $5 in tokens, I'm saying do not give that to me. I highly recommend specifically targeting small creators that are being hit by this and just trying to make it in general. And finally, two notes for transparency's sake. One, this is not a sponsorship with BAT. I was trying to negotiate a deal with them because any anytime I can, I can take something that's helping the community and also benefit, great. I just felt like in this moment, it was incredibly important to get the word out into, and I find it incredibly important for people to mention this when they're talking about anything in this world. I'm not personally advising anyone buy or sell. I personally have basic attention tokens. If it rises, it falls, they benefit and lose based on what happens in the market. But main point, hopefully some of that helps you guys out on your grind. But with all of that said, I pass the question off to you. Do you think that this makes sense long term, or no, you think this is just a massive overcorrection that's screwing over the little YouTuber? Love to know your thoughts, where you're coming from, maybe how it's affected you personally. So let me know in those comments down below. But from there, I want to share some stuff I love today. Today, and today in Awesome brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, make it with Squarespace. It's so incredibly easy to make a beautiful website with their intuitive all-in-one platform. There is nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. So if you want to check it out, start your free trial, go to squarespace.com slash phil. If you really like it, be sure to use offer code phil for 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome is we are about to enter essentially the first phase of the testing of the new app. It's kind of our own walled community of video responses, story requests, opinions, audience debate, essentially where we're going to find some homegrown talent, homegrown citizen journalism. Right now, Android's part of a later release schedule. We're testing everything on iOS. If you are a member of defrancoelite.com, be sure you sign in. Please go sign up. We're gonna be testing it with just a few hundred, maybe a few thousand at first. I'll link to that post down below. And the greater news for everyone, even people that are not on Defranco Elite, if it goes well, hopefully we get this out to you ASAP. Then we got a badass video from NerdWriter1. It's called See With Your Ears, all about Spielberg and sound design. We got a TED Ed video on what are mini brains. Then we got a video from It's Okay To Be Smart called why is blue so rare in nature? And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then in hell has frozen over news, North and South Korea have agreed to attend the opening and closing ceremonies of the Olympic games under one flag. And in fact, they'll have a joint women's ice hockey team. And this is wild considering the general relationship between North and South Korea, as well as the last two years of communication, which was essentially not much. We talked about it recently. It was just massive news that North Korea was finally opening up again to South Korea for the first time in two years. And in total, the North plans on sending a delegation, cheering squad, Taekwondo demonstrators, and officials to the Olympics. And additionally, the two Koreas will train skiers together. And while the South Korean president was praising this news, saying, I believe it will be a great opportunity to thaw the South-North Korea relationship that has frozen solid. While that is what he is saying, there are others that are not so happy. Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Kono said, it is not the time to ease pressure or to reward North Korea. The fact that North Korea is engaging in dialogue could be interpreted as proof that the sanctions are working. And also the situation is not not a done deal.
deal yet. The IOC has to have a meeting on this. The IOC issuing the statement, we are sure that the two Korean delegations will present their ideas and proposals at the meeting on Saturday. This will enable the IOC to carefully evaluate the consequences and the potential impact on the Olympic Games and the Olympic competitions. There's also the question of how this would work because of the sanctions on North Korea. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that meeting on Saturday. And I will say personally, I I'm conflicted on this matter. I mean, I like it because if conversation can de-escalate a potentially catastrophic situation, fantastic. But at the same time, working with the North Korea is that normalizing and essentially saying, what you're doing's okay. What are the potential long-term effects of that? And then I'll pass the question off to you. Do you like this move or you think this is ridiculous? And then let's talk about this USA Gymnastics, Michaela Maroney, Chrissy Teigen situation. And you most likely remember in October of last year, Michaela Maroney comes forward as one of the over 100 women who had been sexually assaulted by former USA Gymnastic doctor, Larry Nassar. Now Nassar has already been sentenced to 60 years in prison after pleading guilty to federal charges for child pornography in December. He's also pled guilty to 10 counts of first degree criminal sexual assault in two Michigan courts. Nassar's latest sentencing hearing began on Tuesday this week and around 20 of his victims have spoken out against him. According to prosecutors, 98 of his 125 victims are expected to address the court this week. But news came out that Maroney was not expected to be one of them. And the reason for that was because Michaela Maroney had reportedly signed a non-disclosure agreement as part of a settlement with USA Gymnastics in 2016. And according to Maroney's attorney, that NDA stated that if she said anything about Nassar's abuse, she could be fined $100,000 or more. And that probably sounds familiar because we talked about in December that a lawsuit was filed against USA Gymnastics. That lawsuit alleging that they illegally sought to buy her silence as part of a $1.25 million settlement. This in order to allow that monster Nassar to leave quietly. And the lawsuit argues that Maroney was coerced into signing this agreement because she needed money for counseling. Counseling that was necessary because she was trying to deal with the abuse she received by Nassar. But on that note, USA Gymnastics claimed that her former lawyer brought up the idea of the NDA. It wasn't their idea. But no matter what, we're talking about a situation where a young girl who was abused had an NDA in a contract she signed to not talk about that abuse. To me personally, that's disgusting and that's just a stain that won't go away as far as USA Gymnastics. But then this week, in walks in model Chrissy Teigen. And she brought new attention to all of this by tweeting out a headline about the NDA and writing, the entire principle of this should be fought. An NDA to stay quiet about this serial monster with over 140 accusers. But I would be absolutely honored to pay this fine for you, Michaela. TV producer Michael Schur responding, I'll split it with you. Kristen Bell saying, I'll one third it with you guys. And then Michaela Maroney ended up responding to all of this through her attorney saying, I'm not on social media right now, but I wish I was for this. I'm shocked by your generosity and I just want you to know how much hope your words bring to all of us. I just can't get over the fact that someone I don't personally know is sticking up for me, let alone a strong woman that I've looked up to for years. Thank you, Chrissy, you're so inspiring and things are starting to change because of people like you. Just saying that was worth the decision to speak up regardless of a fine. And then late Tuesday night, USA Gymnastics responded. USA Gymnastics has not sought and will not seek any money from Michaela Maroney for her brave statements made in describing her victimization and abuse by Larry Nassar, nor for any victim impact statement she wants to make to Larry Nassar at this hearing or at any subsequent hearings related to the sentencing. This has been her right and USA Gymnastics encourages Michaela and anyone who has been abused to speak out. USA Gymnastics remains focused on our highest priority, the safety, health, and well-being of our athletes and creating a culture that empowers and supports them. And so that's the situation as it is today. Now, do, will Michaela Maroney go to court and speak out? We don't know. But for me personally, this just feels like USA Gymnastics trying to repair their reputation. It's hard to forget that not only did they bring this guy on and apparently nobody knew anything despite the massive number of young girls he was doing this to. That even after he was no longer with USA Gymnastics, they didn't warn anyone else despite secretly working with authorities. During that time, we know Larry Nassar was still abusing young girls. In a situation where they signed a contract with a young girl, that had an NDA that said we would fine you if you talked about this. And for USA Gymnastics to act like they're even part of a positive movement instead of what the problem was. It's ridiculous, it's disgusting, I'm glad people with the megaphone are using it. And then let's talk about a real-life spy story that we have today. And this is a story that actually starts in 2010. In 2010, the Obama administration and the CIA began noticing that assets, informants, and agents are going missing in China. At first, they assume that this is just normal attrition. In intelligence, assets come and go, they're caught and killed on occasion. But then the CIA really starts to freak out. Eh? They realize it's more than just one or two agents. The Chinese have seemingly caught on to the CIA's operations. They begin to dismantle the U.S.'s operations in China at an alarming rate. Reportedly, from 2010 to 2012, between 18 to 20 assets were killed or caught by the Chinese. Now the CIA won't admit how many assets are in China, but it's widely considered to be nearly the entire amount of agents in Beijing. And some of those killed were killed in a dramatic fashion. There are reports that Chinese counterintelligence officials went to a Chinese government building where a CIA informant worked and gunned him down right in front of others as a message to others who might have been working for the CIA. And of those found by the Chinese, at least 12 are believed to have been killed. So the CIA and the FBI, who they work closely with when it comes to catching leaks, counterintelligence, they all begin panicking. The loss of so many agents and informants in China could take years to rebuild. There's also the question of how is this happening? At first, it was assumed the Chinese managed to crack the encryption on CIA messages to operatives in China. 
But by the end of 2012, it was clear that there was a mole. And so both the FBI and the CIA began to shrink down the list of potential suspects. And then they landed on Jerry Chun Shing Li. Jerry was a 53-year-old former CIA employee. He left when his career plateaued. He was a naturalized US citizen and worked for the CIA between 1994 and 2007. In 2007, he left for a business opportunity in Hong Kong. Some here believe that it was set up by the Chinese government. From there, there are records that he returned with his family in 2012 for a trip to Virginia. And during his stays and stops at hotels, the FBI searched his belongings in secret. And they ended up finding two handwritten notebooks. They're described as an address book and a date book. And reportedly, those notebooks ended up containing secret and top secret information about the CIA and its operations in China. This, including true names of operatives, phone numbers, and their locations. So then in 2013, the FBI and the CIA make up this situation to get Mr. Lee to go to an interview. They offer him a possible contract with the CIA. This is a common thing among former employees. During the five interviews between May and June, they try to fish information about his travels and business in China. During this, he never reveals his secret notebooks. He defends his reason for moving to China, but he ultimately ends up not getting arrested and it's unclear why. The FBI seemingly knew he had unlawfully recorded top secret information. But all of that brings us to this week. The CIA and the FBI got word that Saturday, Mr. Lee was coming to the United States. They scrambled, they filed charges against him, they met him at the airport and they arrested him. And he was detained in Brooklyn and charged with unlawful possession of classified documents. He's currently being held without bail and awaiting transfer to facilities in Virginia. And I will say there is something interesting to note here. He is only being charged with unlawful possession of classified documents in a situation where it seemingly would be justified to charge him with treason. And there are two prevailing theories here. One, he was coming to the US on such short notice, the FBI needed something to charge him with. So they were like, we have the most evidence on this specific thing, charge him, arrest him. And two, some believe the CIA didn't want full on espionage charges applied right now, as that means the evidence they would need to provide in court would expose programs they currently have. But either way, as of right now, because Jerry is just charged with this one thing, he faces a maximum penalty of 10 years. But if at some point espionage charges are applied, he faces a maximum penalty of death. And so that's where we are right now. It'll be interesting to see if there are more charges applied on top of this soon. We'll have to wait and see. And then there are several stories I want to talk about, but that is where we're going to end today so that this show can go out on time. There's several stories I want to get to, but we'll be able to knock those out by Friday. That said, of course, with this being the Philip DeFranco show, I'd love to know your thoughts on the last story, the first one, anything in between. Let me know what you're thinking. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. That way you make sure you don't miss these daily videos, which actually, if you did miss yesterday's show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to watch the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.